Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Q1 2024 Analyst Conference Call and Live Webcast. I'm Moritz, the Chorus Call Operator. I would like to remind you that all participants will be in a listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. The presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. You can register for questions at any time by pressing star and one on your telephone. For operator assistance, please press star and zero. The conference must not be recorded for publication or broadcast. At this time, it's my pleasure to hand over to Iona Patrinici, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you for joining us for our first quarter 2024 results call. As usual, our Chief Executive Officer, Christian Saving, will speak first, followed by our Chief Financial Officer, James Von Molka. The presentation, as always, is available to download in the Investor Relations section of our website, db.com. Before we get started, let me just remind you that the presentation contains forward-looking statements which may not develop as we currently expect. We therefore ask you to take notice of the precautionary warning at the end of our materials. With that, let me hand over to Christian. Thank you, Joanna, and a warm welcome from me. I'm delighted to be discussing our first quarter results with you today. In February, we laid out a clear path to our 2025 objectives for financial performance and capital distributions, and we have delivered in line with our objectives and targets. Group revenues were 7.8 billion euros. This reflects business growth and franchise momentum, particularly in areas where we have been investing, like our capital light businesses, while net interest income was more resilient than expected. This performance underlines the benefit of our complementary business mix. We are delivering on our cost targets. Adjusted costs were in line with our commitment to a quarterly run rate of around 5 billion euros for this year. Provision for credit losses remained elevated this quarter, but in line with our expectations and prior guidance considering where we are in the credit cycle. Portfolio quality remains very solid, and we continue to expect provisions for the year to be at the higher end of our guidance range of 25 to 30 basis points of average loans. Our return on tangible equity was 8.7% in the first quarter, up from 8.3% in the first quarter last year. Capital remains robust. Our CET1 ratio was 13.4%, enabling us to remain on track in raising distributions to shareholders and supporting business growth. Let me unpack some of the drivers of our first quarter results on slide two. Pre-provision profit was up by 11% year on year to 2.5 billion euros and more than 20% higher since we launched our global house bank strategy. This reflected continued progress on driving operating leverage, which is a core element of our strategy execution. We increased revenues in our operating divisions by 3% year on year, while group revenues were up 1% on a reported basis. Group revenues include corporate and other, which stands to add some level of volatility into our revenue line. As committed, we delivered growth in non-interest revenues and saw an increase of 11% year-on-year in commissions and fee income, mainly in divisions where we made investments last year. As expected, our reported net interest income declined this quarter but net interest income remains stable in our banking books, and James will shortly talk you through this in more detail. We reduced adjusted costs by 6% year-on-year and 5% sequentially to around 5 billion euros, in line with our guidance. This includes bank levies and higher compensation costs, which James will discuss later. Now let's look at the franchise achievement across all divisions on slide three. 
The corporate bank delivered strong business growth with a 5% increase in incremental deals won with multinational corporate clients compared to the prior year quarter. We closed a series of landmark project finance transactions and saw strong momentum across the structured credit market and trust and agency services. We also ranked number one in 17 categories in the 2024 Euromoney Trade Finance Survey, including being the best trade finance bank in Western Europe for the seventh consecutive year. Demonstrating the strengths of our business model, the investment bank delivered a strong quarter with notable advances across the franchise. Investments in talent boosted our origination and advisory market share to 2.6%, a 70 basis point increase compared to the full year 2023, with notable gains in LDCM and DCM, elevating our global ranking from 11th to 7th. Our advisory franchise benefited from the breadth of our product set in the quarter. In GTCR's acquisition of WorldPay, we provided an integrated offering from financial advice to debt financing through to FX and rate hedging. The revenue increase in FIC was driven by both financing and our well-balanced business portfolio, which supports our revenue profile through the cycle. We maintained our strengths in credit trading driven by our investments in 2023, particularly in the flow business, and we also grew revenues in the Americas. These developments further diversified revenue mix in our portfolio. The private bank benefited from our investments. Accelerated business momentum delivered 12 billion euros of net inflows in the first quarter which makes it 17 consecutive quarters of net inflows, bringing the total assets under management to 606 billion euros with a strategic shift toward fee-generating investment solutions. We also continue to strengthen capabilities in strategic areas by increasing coverage of ultra-high net worth individuals in Germany and enhanced offering of investment solutions including third-party exclusive collaborations, which should drive further inflows. Asset management delivered another strong quarter of volume growth. Net inflows were 9 billion euros ex-cash, helping assets under management grow by 45 billion euros to 941 billion euros, over 100 billion euros higher than in the prior year quarter, which we expect to support future revenue generation. Now let me turn to the progress against our strategic objectives on slide four. Starting with revenues, we have delivered a compound annual growth rate of 6% since 2021, in line with our race target range of 5.5 to 6.5% from 2021 to 2025. As promised, we grew mainly in capital light businesses with strong growth in origination and advisory, as well as in the private bank and in asset management, supported by high inflows of assets under management, underlying our franchise momentum. We aim to build on these developments as our franchise expands, following our investments and growth initiatives across all business segments. With net interest income resilient at the start of the year and growth in non-interest non revenues, we feel we are well on our way to our 2025 revenue ambitions. We continue to deliver on our 2.5 billion euro operational efficiency program. We have completed measures with delivered or expected savings of 1.4 billion euros nearly 60% of our target, with around 1 billion euros in savings already realized. The incremental efficiencies this quarter were driven by optimization of our business in Germany and reshaping of our workforce in non-client-facing roads. We have further 
incremental measures already underway, including re-engineering of our operating model via additional front-to-back improvements of product processes and harmonization of infrastructure capabilities. This gives us full confidence that we will deliver on our commitment of a quarterly run rate of adjusted costs of around 5 billion euros in 2024 and total costs of around 20 billion euros in 2025. Finally, on capital efficiency, we achieved a further 2 billion euro reduction in RWAs, bringing aggregate reductions to 15 billion euros. As we are intensifying our work on capital efficiency with further reductions coming from data and process improvements, as well as secretarizations, we remain highly confident that we can meet our target range of 25 to 30 billion euros. Let me conclude with a few words on our strategy on slide five. In a nutshell, we delivered on all key initiatives and targets in the first quarter. And as we progress on our global house bank strategy, we are on the right path for both our clients and our shareholders. First, we have a strong and growing franchise. Clients come to us as our well-balanced, complementary businesses provide them with full-service products and solutions. This supports our revenue growth through different market cycles and drive our market share. And as we said consistently, clients want a partner that offers them an alternative to large U.S. banks, a partner with our expertise, product range, and global network. Second, we continue to improve our operational efficiency. We are maintaining our cost discipline, and as always, we are committed to our approach of self-funding our investments. 2023 marked the peak of our investments but we continue to invest to reduce the complexity of our organization through improving technology, processes, and control capabilities. Finally, we are absolutely focused on creating value for our shareholders. And as we said in previous quarters, we are fully committed to increasing shareholder distributions as rewarding our shareholders is a top priority. We are confident we can increase distributions well beyond our original goal of 8 billion euros in respect of the financial years 2021 to 2025. And we expect to continue to grow dividends and make incremental share buybacks. With that, let me hand over to James. Thank you, Christian. Let me start with a few key performance indicators on slide seven and place them in the context of our 2025 targets. Christian mentioned our continued business momentum, which resulted in revenue growth of 6% on a compound basis for the last 12 months relative to 2021, the midpoint of our recently upgraded revenue growth target range. A cost income ratio of 68% in the first quarter shows a 7 percentage point improvement against 2023, driven by operating leverage from sustained revenue growth and cost management. Our return on tangible common equity was 8.7% for the first quarter. Our capital position remained robust with the CET1 ratio at 13.4% this quarter after absorbing the impact of the share repurchase and the deduction for future distributions in line with revised EBA rules reflecting our payout ratio policy. Our liquidity metrics also remain strong. The liquidity coverage ratio was 136%, above our target of of around 130%, and the net stable funding ratio was 123%. In short, our performance in the period reaffirms our resilience and our confidence in reaching our 2025 targets. With that, let me turn to the first quarter highlights on slide eight. Group revenues were 7.8 billion euros, up 1% on the first quarter of 2023, or 2% excluding specific items. Non-interest expenses were 5.3 billion euros, down 3% year-on-year. 
Non-operating costs this quarter included litigation charges of 166 million euros and 95 million euros of restructuring and severance charges. Adjusted costs decreased 6% year-on-year, mainly due to lower bank levies. Provision for credit losses was 439 million euros, or 37 basis points of average loans, and I will discuss this in more detail shortly. We generated a profit before tax of 2 billion euros, up 10% year-on-year, and a net profit of 1.5 billion euros, also up 10% compared to the prior year quarter. Diluted earnings per share was 69 cents in the first quarter, and tangible book value per share was 29 euros and 26 cents, up 7% year on year. Our tax rate in the quarter was 29%. Let me now turn to some of the drivers of these results. Let me start with a review of our net interest income on slide 9. Net interest income for the group decreased by approximately 100 million euros compared to the previous quarter, with the reduction being driven by accounting effects. As a reminder, these effects are revenue neutral at the group level as the decrease in NII is offset by an increase in non-interest revenues. Excluding these accounting effects, banking book NII was essentially flat as a decline in the private bank was offset by an increase in the corporate bank and lower funding costs in the investment bank and corporate another. The reduction in the private bank net interest margin was largely driven by the non-recurrence of favorable episodic effects in the fourth quarter of 2023 as well as the ongoing impact of beta normalization. On an absolute basis, net interest income in the private bank is in line with the plans on which our NII guidance from last quarter was based. The increase in corporate bank NII was due to a positive one-off impact from a CLO recovery, which was accounted as NII, with deposit betas showing a steady increase in line with our assumptions. We expect to see a corporate bank NII decline in the coming quarters as betas continue to normalize. NII in fixed financing was essentially flat quarter on quarter. We're starting to see margin expansion on the asset side, which, if it continues, will help offset margin compression from beta normalization. In summary, the development in the first quarter reinforces our expectation that we will meet or improve on our prior guidance of a 600 million euro reduction in banking book NII for 2024 relative to the prior year. With that, let's turn to adjusted cost development on slide 10. Adjusted costs were around 5 billion euros for the quarter, specifically 5.02 billion euros excluding bank levies, up 3% year on year, but down 4% sequentially in line with our guidance. We were disciplined in most expense categories and the modest increase was primarily driven by higher compensation and benefit costs, reflecting inflationary pressures on fixed remuneration increases in internal workforce after our targeted investments in talent throughout 2023, and higher performance-related compensation. The increase in compensation and benefit costs was partially offset by workforce optimization. Let's now turn to provision for credit losses on slide 11. Provision for credit losses in the first quarter was 439 million euros, equivalent to 37 basis points of average loans. The decline compared to the previous quarter was driven by moderate stage one and two releases of 32 million euros due to improved macroeconomic forecasts and model recalibration effects which occurred in the prior quarter. Stage three provisions at 471 million euros remained elevated at a similar level to the previous quarter. This included continued weakness in the commercial real estate sector, mainly impacting the investment bank, and the continued impact of operational backlogs in the private bank. Our full-year guidance for provisions is unchanged at the higher end of the range of 25 to 30 basis points of average loans. This reflects our expectation that provisions will remain elevated in the first half of the year and should gradually reduce in the second half. The decline is expected to be driven by an improvement in the credit commercial real estate sector and the partial reversal of backlog-related provisions in the private bank. Before we move, move to performance in our businesses, Let me turn to capital on slide 12. Our first quarter common equity tier one ratio came in at 13.4% compared to 13.7% at year end 2023. We had a strong capital supply this quarter and the sequential decline was driven by our distribution actions and plans together with business growth. 19 basis points of the decrease reflects the ECB approval for our 675 million euro share buyback, which we commenced in March. 
Half of the first quarter net income was deducted for future capital distributions in line with our 50% payout ratio guidance, with the remainder supporting other deductions. 12 basis points of the decrease came from RWA growth. The increase in RWA is net of reductions due to RWA optimization achieved during the quarter. At the end of the first quarter, our leverage ratio was 4.5%, eight basis points lower compared to the previous quarter. The decline was primarily driven by lower Tier 1 capital in line with the movement in CET1 capital, with leverage exposure broadly unchanged. With that, let's now turn to performance in our businesses, starting with the corporate bank on slide 14. Corporate bank revenues in the first quarter were 1.9 billion euros, essentially flat sequentially, and 5% lower compared to the prior year quarter, which marked the revenue peak of the current rate cycle. Year on year, the revenue decrease reflected the normalization of deposit revenues, lower loan net interest income, and the discontinuation of remuneration of minimum reserves by the ECB, predominantly impacting our corporate treasury services businesses partly offset by 3% higher commissions and fee income. On a sequential basis, the revenue of development mainly reflected lower overnight NII. Loans declined by 5 billion euros compared to the prior year quarter and remained flat sequentially, reflecting muted demand and our continued selective balance sheet deployment. Deposits were 31 billion euros higher year on year and over 10 billion euros higher than the fourth quarter, mainly driven by higher term deposits. Provision for credit losses was 63 million euros, or 22 basis points of average loans, essentially flat versus the prior year, reflecting resilience of the corporate loan book. Non-interest expenses decreased sequentially, driven by lower internal service cost allocations and the FDIC special assessment charge in the prior quarter, but increased year-on-year due to higher litigation costs. This resulted in a post-tax return on tangible equity of 15.4%, and a cost-income ratio of 64%. I'll now turn to the investment bank on slide 15. Revenues for the first quarter were 13% higher year-on-year on on a reported basis, or 14%, when excluding specific items. Revenues in fixed income and currencies increased by 7% versus the prior year quarter, demonstrating the underlying diversification of the business. Financing performance was solid, with revenues up 14% year-on-year, reflecting a robust carry profile and strong levels of issuance and securitization fees. As this is the first time we are disclosing financing revenues separately, you can find further information on the composition of the business in the appendix on slide 38. Credit trading revenues were again significantly higher year-on-year as the business continued to build on the successful execution of our strategic initiatives and investments made through 2023, specifically in the flow business. Emerging markets revenues were also significantly higher, with revenues up across all three regions. Client activity was up year-on-year, aided by the investments in Latin America. Foreign exchange revenues were significantly higher, benefiting from the non-repeat of the interest rate market dislocation seen in the prior year. The impact of a refocused business model with investments into controls and technology are also beginning to materialize, and collaboration with the wider franchise is driving cross-sell revenues in the quarter. Rates revenues were significantly lower when compared to a very strong prior year quarter and reflected a reduction in market volatility. Moving to origination and advisory, revenues were up 54% when compared to the prior year quarter with the business gaining market share in a growing fee pool environment, both year-on-year and versus the prior quarter. Debt origination revenues were significantly higher, benefiting from a material improvement in the leveraged debt market conditions, while investment-grade debt issuance activity was also higher year-on-year. Advisory revenues increased versus the prior year despite a reduction in the industry fee pool. The announced pipeline for the second quarter also remained strong. Non-interest expenses and adjusted costs are lower year-on-year as a result of significantly lower bank bank levy charges, partially offset by higher compensation costs, reflecting targeted investments in 2023, including the Numis acquisition. The loan balance increase versus the prior quarter was primarily driven by increased activity in debt origination, linked to the recovery seen in the industry this quarter, with a smaller increase in financing. 
provision for credit losses was 150 million euros, or 59 basis points of average loans. The increase versus the prior year was driven by an increase in stage three impairments, primarily in the CRE portfolio. Turning to the private bank on slide 16, we implemented a new reporting structure this quarter reflecting our client segmentation. For further details, please see slide 39 in the appendix. The division reported revenues of 2.4 billion euros, including higher revenues from investment products and lending, which were more than offset by continued higher funding costs, including the impact of minimum reserve remuneration and the group neutral impact of certain hedging costs now allocated to the business previously in Treasury. Sequentially, revenues remain stable, driven by higher revenues from investment products in line with our strategy to grow commissions and fee income and reflecting seasonality. We saw continued strong business momentum with net inflows into assets under management of 12 billion euros, mainly in investment products in wealth management and private banking, particularly in Germany. Revenues in personal banking were impacted by the aforementioned higher funding and hedging costs for our lending books, partially offset by better deposit revenues in Germany. Wealth management and private banking achieved higher revenues from lending and investment products, offset by lower deposit revenues in the international businesses. The private bank has continued its transformation with nearly 80 branch closures and headcount reductions of more than 800 in the last 12 months benefiting from prior investments. Together with normalized investment spend and lower bank levies, these initiatives drove adjusted costs down by 6%. This trajectory includes the impact of higher service remediation costs, which is expected to roll off over the remaining quarters of the year. Pre-tax profit increased by 24%, driven by primarily by cost reductions. Provision for credit losses in the quarter was affected by elevated workout activity in wealth management, as well as continued temporary effects from the operational backlog in personal banking. Overall, the quality of our portfolios remains intact. The previous year quarter included single-name losses in wealth management. Let me continue with asset management on slide 17. My usual reminder, the asset management segment includes certain items that are not part of the DWS standalone financials. Assets under management increased by 45 billion euros to 941 billion euros in the quarter, a record high. The increase was attributable to positive market appreciation of 30 billion euros, net inflows, and positive FX effects. Net inflows of 8 billion euros were primarily in passive once again, continuing the positive momentum in X trackers that we've seen throughout last year. The business remains the number two ETP provider in EMEA by net inflows with growth outpacing the market and hence gaining further market share. Constructive equity markets are influencing investors to switch into passive strategies, but despite this, we've also reported positive net inflows in active products, mainly driven by fixed income and quantitative strategies. Revenues increased by 5% versus the prior year. This was primarily from higher management fees of 592 million euros resulting from higher fees in liquid products due to increasing average assets under management. Non-interest expenses were 5% higher, while adjusted costs were 3% higher than the prior year. Compensation and benefits costs were higher, mainly driven by variable compensation due to DWS's share price increase, while non-compensation costs were effectively flat despite inflationary pressures. Profit before tax has improved by 6% from the prior year period, mainly reflecting higher revenues. The cost-income ratio for the quarter was 74%, and return on tangible equity was 14.5%, both improving from the fourth quarter of last year. Moving to Corporate Another on slide 18. Corporate Another reported a pre-tax loss of 302 million euros this quarter versus the equivalent pre-tax loss of 208 million euros in the first quarter of 2023. Revenues were negative 140 million euros this quarter, primarily driven by funding and liquidity impacts and other centrally retained items. Valuation and timing differences were positive 2 million euros, driven by negative net impacts from interest rate movements, offset by partial reversion of prior period losses. This compares to positive 239 million euros in the prior year quarter. 
Pre-tax loss associated with legacy portfolios was 96 million euros, driven primarily by litigation charges and expenses. At the end of the first quarter, risk-weighted assets stood at 33 billion euros, including 12 billion euros of operational risk RWA. In aggregate, RWAs have reduced by 11 billion euros since the prior year quarter. Leverage exposure was 36 billion euros at the end of the first quarter, essentially flat to the prior year quarter. Finally, let me turn to the group outlook on slide 19. The first quarter showed that the expected benefits of our investments are materializing and will help to drive growth in non-interest revenues, while we have limited the downside to our net interest income given our interest rate hedging activity. This demonstrates that our businesses are positioned for future growth, contributing to the delivery of our revenue target of around 30 billion euros in 2024. We affirm our target to maintain our quarterly run rate of around 5 billion euros of adjusted costs this quarter and around 20 billion euros for the full year. We expect provisions for the year to come in at the higher end of our guidance range of 25 to 30 basis points of average loans. With our CET1 ratio of 13.4%, we are well positioned and will continue to focus on distributions with a targeted payout ratio of 50% for the financial year 2024. And finally, as Christian said, our full focus remains on our progress through the execution of our strategy and the delivery of our 2035 targets. With that, let me hand back to Joanna, and we'll, we will look forward to your questions. Thank you, James. And with that, operator, we're ready to take questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchdown telephone. You will hear a tone to confirm that you have entered the queue. If you wish to remove yourself from the quest queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use only handsets while asking a question. Anyone who has a question may press star followed by one at this time. One moment for the first question, please. And the first question comes from Kian Abu Hussein from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, first of all, thank you for taking my question and a shout out to Fabrizio and Ram doing such a great job on gaining market share, especially some of, against some of the European peers that also reported today. Um, two questions. Um, first of all, on revenues, um, 32 billion in 2025 that I have talked about in the past. Uh, can you give us a little bit more of a split how we should think about reaching this target um, by division in the context of the below 600 million NII adjustment this year? And then the second question is around cost. Um, 20 billion of adjusted costs this year stayed at 20 billion next year to get to your cost income target. Uh, there's a delta of around 600 to 700 million. If you could please talk about the assumptions that you're making here and what are the easy wins and what are the difficult ones. And if I may, also the bank levy assumptions uh, for this and next year. Thanks. Thank you, Kian, and uh, thank you for your question. Also, thank you very much for the shout out to Fabrizio and Ram. I don't have to do it then anymore. Um, and I even think that we took some market share from the U.S. banks, not only from the European banks, uh, if I think about the performance uh, in, in, in the investment bank. Look, to your first question, uh, let me tackle that. And, and James uh, will then go on with the second question and obviously with uh, further comments to, to question number one. Um, let me start actually um, on, on, on the journey in, in 2024, because it really builds up nicely then to the 2025 story. And, and it, it starts really with this uh, a good Q1, um, in my view, across all businesses. And um, if, if, if we now look how, how the business is progressing, then you can really see that the stable businesses, i.e. the corporate bank, the private bank, and, and asset management, that what we have seen in Q1 is actually a a good number you can have in your mind also for the following quarters. Um, and one item which is uh, um, which is positive for us, and, and, and James can give you uh, some further details, is that uh, the NII is actually behaving even better than we thought, and, and that what we have uh, given you uh, earlier this year. So in this regard, there is uh, less 
um, headwind on the NRI side and on the fee generating side. Um, we are actually um, succeeding there where we wanted to succeed and where the investments um, are now paying off. Uh, you have seen the market share gain in the uh, origination and advisory business. Um, we gained market share by 70 basis points. Uh, we have shown a, a 500 million revenues in, in ONA this, this quarter. To be honest, it's a number which uh, I would also see based on the mandates uh, for Q2. Uh, always hard to then go for Q3 and Q4, but with the investments we have done in people, but also in Numis, uh, I think that, again, Q1 is, is, is a very good marker in the O&A business. We have done, as you said, a very good job uh, in, in the uh, FIC business uh, that is far more diversified, far more stable, far more robust. And with all the rating upgrades uh, we have seen, obviously, um, uh, it also helped to, to regain clients. Um, and these are structural improvements where I would say um, this is, uh, on the one hand, uh, clearly supporting our market share gains, but also telling us that these kind of businesses um, and, and flow business we are doing there is likely coming back also in the following quarter. So in a nutshell, if you, if you take um, Q1, and you have the stability in the three businesses in asset management, private bank and corporate bank, potentially even with some upside in, in asset management. Um, and uh, you, you see the, the, the strong pipeline we have in the O&A business and also the market position we have regained in the FIC business. I'm more than confident that we can achieve the 30 billion um, just by adding up these four operating businesses based on the starting point we have right now. If I then go into 2025, the first comment is that there is um, the tailwind in, on the NRI side in the private bank. We have always talked about that. We have now for quarters and quarters gathered assets under management, like in Q1, in PB and in asset management, and that obviously is driving uh, further, uh, further revenues there. So the NII tailwind and uh, the benefits from the assets under management growth is driving further the private banking revenues uh, in 25 versus 24. Um, then in the corporate bank, actually, there is no NII headwind anymore in 25 versus 24, but we are benefiting from all the mandates which we are, uh, which we are getting, actually, not only here in Germany, but uh, globally. You have seen in the, in the script, actually, um, how also in Q1 versus Q1 last year, we actually increased our mandates, which we won with multinational corporates. And that is, again, a momentum which I can see going forward. So a very stable revenue growth then in the corporate bank uh, also next year. In the investment bank, to be honest, Kian, I absolutely um, further uh, expect that we go to at least the 1% market share gain versus that what we had in 2022. We always said that with the investments which we have done, we want to gain 1% market share. We have done 0.7% in Q1 but there is more to come. And I also do believe that in particular in the ONA market, there is a further recovery. We can see the momentum uh, in the M&A market, in the ECM market, it is starting, but it's not there where I can see the fee pool is in 25. Uh, and then obviously, when I go to the last point in the asset management, also there, we will benefit obviously with the continuous inflow in assets under management. Looking at that, looking how we, we, uh, uh, we have started now Q1, looking at actually um, the better than expected NII trail um, and that the investments which we have done are paying off. Um, I'm not only confident in the 30 billion, but then obviously with the build out in, in, in uh, 25 in the 32 billion. So, Kian, on expenses, um, you know, we talk a lot about run rate, um, monthly, quarterly run rates. We're obviously pleased um, uh, that our focus on delivery achieved the $5 billion this quarter. We intend to continue that quarter after quarter um, over the course of this year and manage to a, an exit rate that, that, that puts us on track for our 25 numbers. A um, couple of moving parts. So, first of all, bank levy. We'd probably expect to book about 50 million this year, 
that might be 150 next year, but it depends very much on assumptions around you know, what the SRB does, uh, growth rates in deposits and the like. Um, then there's the non-operating costs. Um, you know, they've run high for the past several years, but we're, we really think at the tail end of the work we need to do in terms of restructuring and severance, you know, the litigation profile that we've talked about in the past, so I'd love to see that sort of, you know, in, in and around three to four hundred million in total next year, um, which would obviously imply a run, you know, a, a, an, an operating cost level, you know, in the high 19s. On a run rate basis, that means we, we need to be taking expenses down by, say, 50 to 100 million per quarter next year to achieve our numbers. You ask about easy wins, you know, this is all hard work and, and focus and attention execution. You know, the starting point is really the delivery of the, you know, we talk about 1.4 billion of actions that are achieved, but not yet in the run rate. The run rate reflects 400, uh, 1, 1 billion. So there's 400 million to come that's already executed, which, you know, in reality makes your difference in terms of the, the, the quarterly run rate. So. In essence, we just need to crystallize the, the, the existing items. In reality, we're going to have some inflation. We're going to have some additional investments that take place, and we then need to offset those with the remaining actions uh, underway, the, the closing the gap between 1.4 and 2.5, which is the total target. Um, so the, the simple version of what's still to be done, it's still day-to-day -day execution on the glide path of those measures, whether that's branch closures, app decommissioning, headcount reductions, process simplification, front to back on data, all of the things that we've been talking about for some time now are on a glide path for delivery and, and we we're confident um, that, that we're, we're set up to achieve the goals we laid out for, for this year and next. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Kian. And the next question comes from Anke Reingen from RBC. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you very much um, for taking my questions. Um, the first one is um, on capital. Um, now we start with a 13.4, and um, I'm just trying to understand how much uh, room there is um, for additional buybacks in the course of the year. Is it um, you're aiming, I guess you said in the quarterly report, uh, aiming for flat, which would be 13.7, or would you be happy with 13.5 as well? And how, how should we think about um, potential impacts for the rest of the year? Um, any regulatory headwinds, and how quickly can you um, deliver on the, 50, the remaining 15, 10 to 15 billion of RWA um, optimization? And then secondly, um, on loan losses, um, what does give you the confidence about the decline um, in the second half? Um, I guess your um, commercial real estate, the stress loss is unchanged, but what's the impact of rates uh, staying higher for longer? Um, is there any pressure by um, the regulator to address commercial real estate exposure faster? And also you mentioned um, a reversal of the backlog-related provisions um, in the private bank. Um, how much is this um, in terms of and could be a benefit in the second half? Thank you very much. Thanks, Anke. Um, so look, the, the target that we've been working to is really a January 1st target with the Basel III um, you know, impacts reflected and, and a, a 200 basis point gap to MDA against that. So solve for 13.2 on January 1st with the 15 billion in it that we've talked about. Um, and really what we have in the balance of the year is, is earnings less additional uh, stock buybacks um, and the impact of business growth. And then from a model methodology, all that stuff, think of that as, as, as neutral. We're working through that capital optimization to, to at least offset those pressures. Q1 is always a, a quarter where you know, you'll see more burdens on the capital supply side. So I would not look at that as, as representative of the capital bill that, that, that earnings you know, can drive. And while Q1 is usually the, um, you know, a high point in terms of organic capital generation, you know, we've had a pretty good track record of generating sort of 25 to 30 basis points per quarter um, you know, over the past several years. So, 
So that's sort of the walk um, that, that we would outline to you. On the loan losses, um, the we talk about sort of three things that are running high in the in the first quarter: commercial real estate, which we expect to improve gradually over the year; um, the the collections activity disruption that that we expect to also correct and potentially um, see some recoveries in the second half. And equally on the wealth management side, we've had a series of cases over the years where we hope that as we move to to work out, there may be recoveries there as well. Against an I'll call it underlying strong credit portfolio. So that reversion in the second half is one that at least based on everything we see at the moment, we have good line of sight on. Um, and so we'd need to, in essence, compensate for for every basis point above 30 today, we'd, we'd need to compensate um, being below 30 in the second half, but but we see the drivers that, that, that would um, would drive us there. And lastly, you know, commenting on part of your question, We've had a, a very deep dive into the commercial real estate portfolio over the last, you know, four, five, six months, sort of name by name, um, and feel comfortable that that with the provisions we took uh, in in Q1, we've we've, you know, we've we reflect the, the risks that we see in that portfolio. We have, as we mentioned, seen the firming in our portfolio that's visible, you know, in some of the market pricing indices and, and what have you. While that is to some degree rate sort of dependent, um, you know, we, we do think with a, that we're seeing a floor and, and you know, and, and are, are optimistic, at least based on what we see, that that'll be, um, that'll be preserved over the, over the balance of the year. And you don't see any pressure by the regulator to take anything faster? Look, the regulator is, is very focused. I mean, I mean, we're obviously careful in, in how we comment on these things, <laughs> but, but the regulator is naturally focused on how the banks broadly defined are managing through, um, you know, a, a sectoral stress in commercial real estate, not just in the U.S., but globally. Um, so you'd expect them to be paying a great deal of attention and, 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 and for us, as consequently, to be, to be looking carefully at our portfolio. Thank you very much. And the next question comes from Nicolas Payen from Kepler Chevre. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. I have two, please. Um, the first one will be on NII. Uh, you mentioned in your paper remark that you could exceed your guidance of, of a decrease of 600 million uh, in NII this year. And I was wondering, what are, what are the conditions uh, to beat this guidance, actually? Is it higher rates for longer? Is it stable betas? Is it an improvement on the asset margins, as you mentioned? Any color will be, will be great. And also, what kind of magnitude we could, uh, we could expect regarding the, the beats on this, uh, in this guidance? And the second question would be on the on incremental share buyback uh, for H2. Have you have you got any any update to give us whether you have applied for this new share buyback with the ECB or what kind of of, of discussion you have with the regulators regarding this topic currently? Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Um, so on the net interest income, I think magnitude. It's it's early in the year to say, but but potentially considerable. You know, in 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 three digit. Millions um, uh, e easily in three-digit millions, put it, put it that way. And the drivers are better deposit margins, better deposit volumes, um, firming loan margins, um, better funding costs, including unsecured. Um, uh, beta is still running behind. To some extent, the interest curve that you see, the, uh, the implied forward rates, although as you can also see in our in our materials, we've we've hedged a lot of that, um, uh, but but the the short answer is that that all of those things, the drivers, are actually showing favorable compared to our planning, with the one exception that goes in the other direction of of loan volumes, um, and there obviously we'd like to see a pickup as as the economy firms and 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 demand rises, but but all of those drivers are are playing a role and and giving us um, confidence in the outlook. But Nicola, on the uh on the buybacks, um, nothing changed from our target, uh, which we which we gave to the market before. Um, we have uh, clearly stated that uh, shareholder value creation is a key priority for us, um, and, and hence we are fully committed to the plans we have outlined to you, and that also means fully committed um, that um, we have a goal 
um, to actually distribute beyond the eight billion um, which we which we gave you earlier now with regard to timing. I think we are doing exactly that. What we also said, um, we always said that uh, we wanted to await Q1. Uh, we wanted to see that Q1 is running in line with our own plan, um, that we show operating leverage, that we show um, further increasing revenues, that we have costs under control. Exactly this has happened, um, and that gives us the confidence um, that we can now obviously um, also plan for um, the next steps and go into the discussions. But that is a discussion with the regulator, and um, this should be always respected. Um, but um, as I said, um, we always said Q1 needs to be done. We are happy with Q1, and now we take the next steps. Thank you very much. And the next question comes from Julia Aurora Miato from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, good morning. My first question, um, I go back, I want to go back on to the commercial real estate. Um, one thing which surprises me a little bit is that the 31 billion is not going down. Um, it is going slightly up due to the, to the effects, but I would expect, you know, Deutsche Bank to be deleveraging this exposure. So top down, why is that not moving? Uh, would be my first question. And then, um, Secondly, I noticed that your flag litigation is expected up versus 2023. Um, any comment there? Um, thank you. So, Julie, on the second question, mostly to do with the relatively sizable release we had in the in the fourth quarter. Um, so, I, I you know don't necessarily look at it as a deterioration in in our position so much as 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 that in, that effect. On mm -hmm. CRE, on CRE. You know, it's it's essentially a portfolio that through extensions and refinancings is rolling over. FX plays a small role and, and a very selective, you know, uh, new new financing activity, typically in, in lower risk uh, areas um, that 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 flow into the definition. But um, uh, but it's it's yeah, it's a rolling portfolio. And I don't I wouldn't expect it to 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 diminish dramatically um, in, in the next several quarters. Thanks. And the next question comes from Jeremy CG from BNB Paribas Exxon. Please go ahead. Morning. Thank you. Um, just a couple of follow-ups on topics that have already been touched on. Um, the first one, just picking up on CRE again. Um, the modified loan number that you show us, which I think is 10 billion here, you know, that's been increasing from 8 billion and 6 billion over the last couple of quarters. Are you still happy with the nature of those modifications that these are healthy, constructive, uh, they're not just extend and pretend? Um, so is that process still okay as far as you're concerned? That's, that's my first question. And, and then the second question, um, again, just kind of picking into the cost point, your adjusted cost X banks levies um, were up about 2.5% year on year. Um, is that just noise or is that a source of pressure that, you know, causes you concern looking at the need to bring costs down, as you've discussed? Is, is, is that increase year on year any kind of concern to you? So, Jeremy, um, the modification process, yeah, I'd, I'd say in short, okay. Um, you know, we've talked about this for a while. In, when, as we look at each um, individual property, we engage in the discussion with the sponsors on refinancing. Often that includes terms, new equity, um, sometimes con sort of concessions from the banks, and that's as it should be. I don't think of it as a, as a giant extend and pretend process, but a healthy process of, of, of managing these assets through a cycle. You should expect the modifications to continue to rise, um, but if if this is a cycle that, as we think it is, is burning itself out, then then the provision number as a percentage of that of that denominator should begin to decline um, along with the gradual reduction in in CLPs on a quarterly basis. Uh, and so that's that's what we would expect to see going forward. Um, a lot of work still lies ahead, but um, but so far behavior has been rational in light of valuations. Um, on adjusted costs, um, that increase represents, if you like, the cumulative impact of the various investments we'd be made, we'd be making. 
We've talked about investments in controls. We've even talked about investments in technology. Also, the front office investments we made last year and now the run rate impact of the new MIS trend transaction as well, fully in the quarter. So that, that increase is there. Is it concerning? Um, no, insofar as it was deliberate actions and, and targeted investments on our part. But as, as per the, the answer to, to Kian, now the work um, you know, needs to be done to, to take that run rate you know, back down um, modestly over the next seven quarters. Perfect. Thank you. And the next question comes from Chris Hellum from Goldman Sachs International. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, everybody. So um, two from me, just first on NII, and it's a bit of a follow-up to Nicola's question earlier. In the prepared remarks, you sounded at the margin a bit more confident on what you'd expect to see for this year. But if you look into next year, has anything changed for the NII outcome then, particularly in light of you know, the moves we've seen in rate expectations in the past couple of months, um, and also the positive development in deposit funding costs in Germany. And then secondly, so thank you for the extra disclosure on FIC. Um, if I look at the business mix on slide 30, that's split between EM credit and macro. Is that the right mix of business when you think about the global house bank strategy? Or would you expect that pie chart to change shape meaningfully over the next few years, whether it be through investments or share gains, et cetera? Yeah. Okay, Chris, I'll, I'll try both. And, and, and Christian may want to add. So, Actually, our hope was that we would sound a little bit more confident on this call than in the prepared remarks on um, on the net interest income. You know, we are comfortable with the trajectory, um, but we're trying not to get too far over our skis on it. Um, we think it's supportive of the trajectory to 30 billion this year and 32 billion next year. And the way I'd, I, you know, to be honest, the way this will work, Chris, is the incremental NII that we expected to get in 25 would be compared to the higher base in 24 so that it would it would essentially just add because of the factors that I that I outlined um, being the drivers so so short version this is incremental in 24 and carries over to 25 the um, the numbers you know that donut on the in the appendix that does move over time there's no question it's depending on the mix shift in the in the market environment generally we think we've got a healthy portfolio mix um in in our what I'll call fixed markets thick markets we're describing here as thick x financing um but but it's driven by macro and micro trends you know client positioning it's driven by you know the 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 extent to which structured transactions are happening in any one of those product areas. So it, it does move around, but we think of it as a healthy portfolio mix. Yeah, and, and, and Chris, I think um, two additional comments. Number one, um, if, if, if you take that over time, actually, uh, we have seen a, a nice uplift, actually, in credit trading following uh, investments which we have done. Um, and while we wanted to actually have a more balanced uh, uh, portfolio in the FIC X financing uh, business. And secondly, I would say that uh, going forward, um, if you think about the global house bank concept and the way how actually Fabrizio is tying up um, the day-to-day -day FIC work with the corporate bank, I would say that um, we have actually a really good chance um, also, with that, what is happening on the corporate side and how corporates are thinking that the emerging markets piece and, and, and also parts of, of the macro pieces are actually further increasing. We can see that these discussions are happening each and every day. Uh, we have an initiative where we are actually targeting uh, corporates um, within the corporate bank and tying them uh, into our FIC businesses, and we can see the results. So I would say that in a normal development, and now taking aside the comments uh, um, James did on you know, uh, unique and particular transactions, but with the network we have, with the global approach we have, um, I could see that the emerging markets piece and, and, and parts of the market piece are actually growing because the connection of the IB with the corporate bank. Really helpful. Thank you very much. And the next question comes from Stefan Stahlmann from Autonomous. Please go ahead. 
Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for taking my questions. Um, I wanted to ask about the private bank, please. Um, you had another very good flow quarter. Uh, I think your um, annualized growth in wealth management and private banking is running at around 8% annualized from that new money. And I'm really hard pressed to come up with any competitor um, getting close to that kind of growth. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about what you're doing there? What geographies are driving this, whether they're particular products or any other unique selling points that are explaining this? And um, a related question, um, one investor alerted me to a story um, on a Swiss media platform this morning, which suggested that Finma is looking at your wealth management business uh, in Switzerland. Is there anything to flag there or is there just a nothing burger? Thank you. Thank you um, for your questions. Let me start, and, and, and James will uh, 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 will amend. Uh, look, on the Finmar uh, side, uh, we gave a clear statement um, that there is no restriction. And uh, um, secondly, obviously, I hope you respect that, that we are not going more into details when it comes to regulatory discussions. But um, we have every we have said everything in writing. Um, so for us, uh, uh, we can onboard clients. Um, Number two, uh, with regard to wealth, wealth management and the private bank, yes, um, it has been actually, um, since uh, Claudio has been with us, um, it, it has been always our focus actually to go more into the investment businesses. By the way, not only in wealth management, but also in the private bank. We see that as a clear growth area and in particular as a clear long-term growth areas. I think I said it before on these calls. If you think about what is one of the real sticky items also here in, in Germany going forward, it is what happens with the pensions of our retail clients. And the focus Claudio is giving to the investment businesses, where obviously we have an expertise which not a lot of other banks, in particular in the home market, have, is something which is now helping us a lot. It also helps us, by the way, that we got all the rating upgrades, that uh, we have a completely different reputation in the market, and the investments Claudio did uh, in wealth management outside uh, Germany, in parts of European countries, in particular in Asia, you know that we invested heavily, uh, heavily in the Middle East, um, are now all paying off, and therefore, um, yes, we are happy with the growth, but it's part of a two- to three-year story um, and strategy which, which Claudio built. Now, as we see the success, in particular in wealth management, as I said, we want to bring it more and more into um, the more private bank and retail bank business because there is actually the need for the clients. And therefore, I expect actually that we do see these kind of growth rates um, also going forward, which is again supporting that what I said um, in the first question uh, from Kian, one should not underestimate the continuous growth and revenues actually in those business from the continuous accumulation of assets under management, in particular in this business. So clear focus of Deutsche Bank. One thing just to add, I think, I think the revenue profile is supportive, as you say, both fee and commission income and the interest income long term in, in private bank. I think the second thing is, as we talked about, the credit loss provisioning right now is more elevated than we would expect it to be sort of on a, on a continuous basis. The last thing to also highlight is this quarter, I think, now shows the trajectory that we're on from a cost perspective with a significant year-on-year -year cost reduction that, that we expect to build on in terms of trajectory. So starting to see the restructuring, the technology investments, the, the, the distribution platform reductions come through, all of which should, should significantly enhance the pre-tax profit margin of, of PB over time. Great, very clear. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question comes from Tom Hollett from KBW. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, so the first one, just curious around the, the fee progression at the, the, the private bank. Um, you know, if I look at market levels, they're up sort of 8% on year on year. Um, you've had a lot of inflows, and yet your revenues in the first quarter haven't really moved much. Um, so if I kind of look at your guidance for the division, it would seem you're expecting quite a bit of a pickup over the next nine months. So I suppose what is driving that relative to the first quarter? And then secondly, 
you know, just looking at the financing revenues where you you, you put a really helpful slide in there um, in the pack. I mean, look, it's been a major source of growth for you, but also your peers. Um, you know, I'm just curious about what's driving that kind of growth differential kind of versus pre-COVID levels and how sustainable that is. Um, because I, I, I suppose if I look at the leverage consumption of the ID, it's gone up considerably over the last four years. Um, you, you know, so maybe if you could provide a sense of kind of the margins of that business or the capital intensity, that would, that would also be great. Thank you. So, Tom, I, I just the, – the, the way you think about, about fee and commission income in the private bank is it's, it's sort of a client business volume measure. So uh, Christian referred to it as sticky. So as we build balances, we build activity. You've seen a, a year-on-year growth rate of, of 2%. Uh, but now at a level um, in the first quarter that significantly exceeds, you know, you know, any quarter last year, especially the second, third, and fourth. Um, and so we think that that's going to continue to build on itself and, and create sort of more and more year-on-year -year differential. There is some amount that obviously depends on, on, on clients' investment activity, trading activity, if you like, in any given quarter, but but the call it the stable revenue base that we're seeing in, in private bank and fee and commission income growth is, is, is very encouraging and I think um, is set to continue. I think in terms of your question about resources in the FIC business, we're, we've been very focused on that, you know, uh, cons sort of consistently over the years. Um, we tend to look at it in terms of revenue production related to RWA as you can see, market risk RWA relatively modest for us, so it is it is principally credit risk RWA both in the balance sheet and derivative businesses. But we we think we've got some of the best in the business at at, at understanding and optimizing that. And the same is true of leverage exposure, um, where where we manage to to the constraints of our balance sheet, but work to optimize how we deploy that leverage exposure to support clients. Uh, as well as the revenue profile. Sometimes, by the way, the, the business you do um, is leverage exposure intensive, but not RWA intensive, and sometimes the opposite. Uh, and hence, the, the optimization efforts that we go to there are, are you know, considerable and, and sophisticated. Um, so I, I would um, stop there. I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, just to follow up, just for, for my side on the private bank, um, is, it, is it fair for us to assume that kind of, you know, it increased one and a half percent year on year? Is, is that something similar we should be expecting for the rest of the year? Or, or are you more confident on that for the rest of the year? I think if you look at the, the prior quarter comparisons year on year for both CB and PB, what you'd expect is, is, a, is a relatively significant uh, acceleration of, of the of the year on year growth in those in those fee and commission lines in the coming quarters. Okay, thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star followed by one. And the next question comes from Andrew Coombs from City. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, I'll also echo the previous remarks. Thank you for the additional disclosure uh, on IB revenues as well. Um, two questions from me. Um, firstly, on costs, uh, you drew out uh, the FDIC uh, charge in Q4. Uh, you haven't drawn out anything in Q1, but I know a number of the US banks did take a top up. Um, so could you say, is there anything in costs for FDIC this quarter as well that you'd like to specify? Um, and then the second question, just on the corporate and other division, now that's been restated uh, to include the legacy portfolios, I think you've got a 226 loss this quarter, but it includes quite a sizable benefit on uh, timing differences or valuation and timing differences. So, so what should we think of as, or what do you think is the usual quarterly run rate for that division going forward? Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. So, um, eight million is the number this quarter on FDIC. Uh, by some a quirk of accounting, we can't characterize it as bank levies, so we don't call it out separately. 
Um, but it also means, you know, if I look at the net going into this quarter's run rate, actually there were there's probably more things pushing it up than pushing it down, of which FDIC was one. So, you know, there's always some degree of volatility. Um, V&T was, was um, a feature this year, certainly year on year. In the quarter, it was relatively more neutral, but but reflected really changes in, in the interest rate curve. By the way, some of which we would expect to get back um, in, in the balance of the year through pull to par. Um, always hard to say, therefore, what the pre-tax profit I- impact is going to be. We, we talk in the guidance about what the shareholder expense is that we expect, what the incremental, what the sort of call it run rate or annual treasury um, funding costs are. So for modeling purposes, I, I would go with sort of a, a quarterly version of that annual guidance um, and accept that there is some volatility in, in, in valuation and timing. Incidentally, we've been working over the years to, to reduce and minimize that volatility to the extent we can. So, so lots of work's gone into to hedge accounting programs and other things um, to, to both manage the risks, the balance sheet risks that we have, but do so um, in a way that is as, as accounting neutral as, as we can. And, and we've made some good progress in that regard. Okay, thank you. So it seems there are no further questions at this time. So I would hand back to Iona Patrinice for head of uh, for clo- any closing remarks. Thank you, and thank you for joining us and for your questions. Um, as ever, for any follow up, please come through to the investor relations team, and we look forward to speaking to you at our second quarter call. Ladies and gentlemen, the conference is now concluded and you may disconnect. Thank you for joining and have a pleasant day. Goodbye.